to Inside the Vault, a Carolina Panthers podcast, episode number 33. I'm your host, Ryan Smith. And uh, as you know by now, my podcast here is brought to you by the Keep Pounding Podcast Network, which you can find on Twitter at kppounding underscore FSSN. And this podcast also powered by Fans First Sports Network on Twitter at Fans First SM. My latest guest here on Inside the Vault tonight, episode number 33, he's a former writer at Cat Crave and Panthers Wire. Follow him on Twitter. And I apologize, Brian, in advance if I should have asked about your last name, at Brian Palmese, maybe. You can correct me if on that, on that. But Brian, <laughs> welcome to Inside the Vault. Hey, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. You were very close. It's not a common last name. So you were right on with the Twitter uh, handle. <laughs> Okay. Well, what is that? What's the correct pronunciation before we get going? Uh, Palmisi. Palmisi. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Brian Palmisi, everyone. So, Brian, let's start with uh, your location. You were in Seattle, out in the uh, Seahawks country. So, um, talk to us how a former writer of some uh, Panther blogging and uh, sites mm -hmm. landed up in Seattle, Washington, out there. Sure. So, we are definitely deep in Seattle uh, territory, but Happy to be a Panther fan representing the uh, Process Blue up here. Uh, I was in Charlotte, Charlotte for quite a bit and then just uh, had an opportunity to come out west. Love the outdoors, love the area. Um, so I've just been out here for a little bit, moved to Hawaii for a little while as well and made my way back to Seattle. But um, it's great being up here, watching Panther games and um, Seahawks fans are you know pretty tolerant. We always seem to play them every year. So I've had a great opportunity to see them you know, either here or going back to Charlotte. So it's great to have that kind of that rivalry that we started back when Cam was here during the Legion of Boom time. <clears throat> I was going to say, it seemed like we played them every year. It seemed like yeah. uh, when Russell and Cam were quarterbacking uh, the teams respectively. It, it, and if it didn't, it was almost like it was every year. So um, let's get into the Panthers offseason uh, in review. Um, just your overall 30,000-foot uh, view of the offseason so far. We'll go uh, a little deeper as we go, but just kind of your uh, general view so far. Sure. Um, I'm optimistic and very positive. Uh, I was this same time last year, which I think a lot of Panther fans are kind of going through that where you yeah. felt this way about a year ago, but uh, this year just seems different. Um, I think this year is going to be mainly transition. I think a lot of Panther fans, I hope, have patience this year. I know we've been patient over the years. Uh, it's been a good five years since we've had a winning record. You know, It's been a while since we've been to the playoffs, but yeah. I think this year is all about patience and making sure that we understand the big plan, the big picture, and knowing that this can't be what was done the last couple of years can't be fixed in one off season. Um, just making sure, you know, between free agency and the draft and we won't fill all the holes this year, but we'll take steps forward and just making sure that we understand that. Yeah. I mean, for one, I, I, we knew Brent Tillis was going to be good at his job, but the man has done an excellent job at the, with the cap so far, I might say coming over from the Kansas city chiefs. Uh, just the way some of these contracts are structured, Brian, it just seems like, this is different. This this guy, it's not he came from a winning organization and is now taking some of those cash and cap ways and taking it into our accounting in Charlotte. So it's nice to see there. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if you just look at some of the deals that are there, they were signed long term, but just the way they took that first year and kind of using that rip the band-aid off this first year with all the old contracts and they're setting the new ones up in a way that sets us up, I think, for long-term success where we're not going to be handicapped each year. We'll take our lumps this year and kind of put out the product that we have, but knowing that from 2025 and beyond, I think we're setting ourselves up really well. Yeah. Um, so let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit. Um, best signing, in your opinion, um, for this Panthers offseason? And then uh, I'll tell you if I agree or if I have the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to kind of throw a curve. I don't know if it's, you would consider it a signing, but I think the trade we made for Deontay Johnson, I think that's probably my favorite move of the offseason so far. Um, he was kind of on our... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say best transaction, maybe I could have said, but yes, that, that's a good one. Sure. Uh, I think we had, or at least there was rumors out there that he was looking to possibly get moved uh, in the offseason. It was kind of a hope that we would bring somebody like that in because there is there weren't too many players that fit exactly what we need at wide receiver the way Deontay Johnson does. He's still young enough that he can be part of the core long term. Um, I think they're going to figure that out this year. I hope he's part of it, but I think the separation, the speed that everyone's talked about everything that we lacked last year for Bryce Young. I think Deontay Johnson has that in spades. Yeah. I'm going to go, um, I, and I know this is a stretch to say he was probably our best offseason signing, but 
whatever the Panthers did to convince Jadavian Clowney to sign in March versus August, I think is something because he hasn't signed, whether it was with Cleveland, Baltimore, I think going back at least two of his teams until training camp because he didn't want to have to deal with the OTAs and the mini camp. So I don't know what happened. And obviously, I don't have insider information, but something must have found, found uh, sounded pretty good. It could have been just the money, or it could have been something besides, or in addition to money, you know, to have him sign in March. And I, I think just having them throughout the offseason programs, being with the uh, younger guys, kind of coaching them up, guys like Amari Barrow, DJ Johnson, uh, guys like that, who uh, he can just really put his veteran leadership to work. Yeah, well said. Um, I agree 100% with the facts that he's never really come in this early and committed and he committed to two years instead of one year. That's a really great observation. What would you put his, the likelihood of that happening? You know, when the rumors were first starting up, did you think 50%, 80%? What was your kind of take when you first heard the rumors that Clowney might be coming to Carolina? Uh, if it was between us and the Jets, uh, truthfully, I thought we had a shot because the Jets are, are, are still a hot mess. You cannot convince me otherwise. Aaron Rodgers is going to maybe play another year or two at most. He says he wants to play another three to four, but I, I just don't see that with a 40-year-old quarterback coming off an Achilles um, and just how bad that offensive line still is. Uh, we all know Tyron Smith won't be playing a full 17 games. Uh, anyway, not a Jets podcast, but I, I knew if it was between us and the Jets, we had a shot. And so uh, yeah. that's just me. And the, let's be honest, Brian, the taxes in Charlotte are much better than New York. So that's got to count for something. Very true. Yeah, I think him just wanting to come back home. I think it's a great story, too, the way he gets to come back and play so close to South Carolina. And I think those ties back to his family, from what the interviews have said, he just seems – his energy just seems like he's really happy to be in Charlotte. Yeah. All right. I hope my listeners uh, will not be too negative on this next question. What is the most questionable signing? Uh, and I use questionable in hyper, you know, in quotes. So, you know, you might not think it was a bad signing necessarily, but, you know, one that you might say, will this work out? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. What, what, what uh, kind of a, I don't want to say alarm bells went off, but what would you say was the most questionable uh signing i think the chase on you know signing coming from jacksonville i just there's still potential you never want to say that a guy can't still step up and prove something after a few years in the league but sure. um i just think something about him coming in it's it's if it's just for a rotational piece on special teams and to kind of come in in certain packages that's fine but i really hope that the that the thought wasn't that he's going to be our uh, solution for an edge or our person to bring in to help with uh Filling Brian Burns' shoes. Yeah, that's a good one. That's exactly what I was going to say as well. He just <laughs> like CJ Henderson, uh, though I am a Gator partially, so uh, family ties to Florida, uh, the Gators. So I hated not seeing CJ Henderson work out personally. But uh, another uh, Jacksonville kind of cast off uh, Chase in is, and so uh, we'll hope to hope he looks uh, a little bit better than Henderson did. Uh, though Henderson had a bounce back year last year. Sometimes you could say in certain games he played decently well. But anyway. Um, he's no longer here, as we know. Um, Panthers resigned Derek Brown. Um, that was big news, uh, and I think we're finally learning from the Brian Burns situation. Where, you know, I said this to a former Panthers defensive end Al Wallace, who was my last guest. Uh, you know, I mentioned something along the lines of, "I said we've released, or no, sorry, we traded McCaffrey, DJ Moore, and now Brian Burns. You know, we got to start getting our homegrown talent." on second contracts. And I think we finally did this uh, with, D with Derek Brown showing that if you put your time, your hard work and investment in and you do things the right way, you're going to be rewarded. And I feel like that's what Dan Morgan and company did. Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of it had to be cleaned up too with the culture. I think we were starting to get that reputation of not taking care of our own. Um, we hit on first round draft picks. That's not the issue. It was just how, the previous regimes handled the buildup to it. And, you know, I think Morgan did the right thing. They got Derek Brown signed early and hopefully washed away some of that, you know, leftover, uh, just the way the fans felt about not being able to hold on to several guys year after year. And Brian Burns, I think was the day of, I remember being very frustrated with it. And now that you kind of see the pieces starting to unravel a little bit and see what the plan is, it's starting to make more and more sense. And 
he was a fan favorite. I mean, he is going to be a heck of a player in New York. Um, there's no doubt about his skill set, but seeing what they've been turned that cap money into, what they've turned the personnel into down the line, I, I think they've done a really good job of recovering from what could have been a really, really bad um, PR move with not re-signing Brian Burns. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I don't think the Panthers will ever admit this publicly, but I feel like if they uh, had a do-over, I think they would, after seeing what Bryce Young did, they were going to, um, pro- they would probably send Brian Burns to Chicago and, and keep DJ. Uh, that's just my gut feeling there. Um, you know, and, and again, again, I got their logic at the time, you know, DJ Moore, it mm-hmm. seemed like on paper was easier to replace than a stud defensive end and a stud pass rusher or, or um, nose tackle and, and Browns. So, I mean, I, I get it. Like I, I totally got the logic, but as we see hindsight's always 20, 20 sometimes. So. Absolutely. If you would have asked anybody last year, who were they going to give up? I think most people in a poll would have said DJ Moore over Brian Burns. It's real easy to look back at it and, you know, who over it and why Burns wasn't the guy. But I think if you look back, definitely more would, would have been the move again. Yeah. Um, let's go to Derek Brown and Dave Canales, kind of this new regime in Charlotte. Uh, Dave uh, Canales, former Office coordinator for Tampa Bay, quarterbacks coach in Seattle. Uh, so Russell, Gino, now Baker. Um, he's got energy. He's got a football IQ. Someone, you know, I just watched the Panthers.com video, uh, and I, I'm I'm hyped. I was going through a wall <laughs> for him, man. Like he yeah. was, he was uh, you know, what's up, Brian? What's up, Brian? You know, what's up, man? Like he was every player, he that energy is so infectious and then uh and then dan morgan you know we're all giving him crap about you know yeah dan you're a former player here that's all well and good you were keith lee before keith lee great but you were buddies with fitterer so are you really <laughs> gonna be able to do the job you were you know so, i mean time will tell we'll see what happens but um i i think dan overall has done a great job so far uh obviously he's had um you know I wouldn't say a flawless performance so far, but I think he's done just about as well as you could do uh, coming in um, as a first year GM. So thoughts on uh, our new head coach, Dave Canales coming over from Tampa Bay and then the promotion for Dan Morgan and uh, former Panther Dan Morgan and how he's doing so far in that role. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with Canales' energy. Uh, There's nothing like it. I think that's what we were hearing going through the whole process is during the interview process, he just interviewed so well and he just had, a passion about him that you rally around. You can see that when you in, in these different videos and just everything, it, it hasn't been one here and one there. It's just been a consistent fire that he has. And I'm excited. He's young, he's up and coming. You know, we kind of could have went that route last time and we ended up going with Frank Reich. But I think a guy like Canales, what he brings to the room, he just has that leadership quality. I think Idzik has he's been with him. So that parody that we keep talking about him and Idzik and Morgan going back to Seattle and, just watching Geno Smith and Baker thrive, I think Bryce, this is the kind of coach Bryce needs. And I think that was part of the interview process. I don't think the Panthers necessarily hired a coach specifically because of Bryce, but I think that was part of the equation. What can you do with Bryce Young? Are you comfortable? Are you going to be able to take this franchise quarterback and make him our leader? And I think Canales has that in spades. And then as far as Morgan, I'm excited. I think it's real easy to kind of latch him in with Federer. And I don't think Morgan didn't have a say in the things that happened, but just like in any company in any leadership roles, your voice is heard, but how much of that impacts the final decisions. And I think Scott had a lot more of that, of Tepper or the final call. And Morgan obviously put his two cents in. Uh, just seeing what Morgan has done, how he just had minimal emotional attachment early during the offseason where he was able to let people go, the Von Bells and the players like that, that we just let go of because that wasn't going to fit what we're doing now and just making sure that he stays aligned with his head coach. I think it's great. And someone made this point. Um, I don't remember who it was, but um, you know, or no, it was, it was Al Wallace last week on my episode. It was Al Wallace. Uh, he said, Dan Morgan, you know, he played uh, and was coached by Sam Mills. I mean, if, 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 uh, if anyone knows the key pounding mantra and the Carolina Panthers ethos, it is Dan Morgan. Absolutely. And you can see that with some of the players he's he's brought in. I know the, the biggest word that we've been using is that dog. And does he have that dog in him? And we keep going back to that. But you can see Dan Morgan, that's just what he epitomizes. And I think a lot of players you're going to see 
through the draft process and any extra free agents as we get closer to the summer that get added are going to fit that role, I think. Yeah. Let's get into Bryce Young a little bit. Um, year two for Bryce coming up. Um, what did you see from him in year one that made you um, uh, be positive for the outlook going forward? And then just your quick analysis from him coming out of Alabama and uh, obviously us making him the number one overall pick last year. Sure. Uh, I think last year, the biggest thing I wanted to see from him was how does he make that jump from college to the NFL? Is it, you know, from week to week, is he able to process? Is he able to learn? Is he able to continue? And honestly, I know the stature was a big thing, but that guy got lit up a lot last year. I mean, week in and week out. And he played, he missed one game. And, you know, if it was a playoff game, I think he probably would have played it. He was a little banged up, but um, I think he got up and he showed a resilience that, I think that was the biggest question mark coming in was, can he go from 12, 13 games a year at the college level? And can he go up to 17 games a year in the NFL? And I think he showed that very well. Um, You know, when he had time, I think he made a lot of good decisions. He had a lot of that off script um, mentality that he was able to roll out and make some big plays, thread the needle in some tight spots, a lot of drops. Um, You know, he made mistakes. He made, in my opinion, I think he had a rookie season. You know, he, thought that he could outrun people that he did in college and in the NFL, you're just not going to do that. You know, these guys are going to, they're all sec players. They're all big 10 players. So I think he was basically what the way a rookie was given the situation. He made the best of it. You know, he made some mistakes. He took his lumps and he came back week in and week out and he stayed a positive leader, you know, in the huddle and on the sidelines most of the season, which was great. And um, your se- so- I'm sorry. You said your second part was when he came out of Alabama. Yeah, just did, did you uh, think he was, you know, worthy of the number one overall pick? Did you have him behind a few other guys? What was your kind of instant analysis from him coming out? Sure. I'll be truthful. I was a C.J. Stroud guy initially. Like, I really liked what I saw from Stroud. Yeah. What, what he did in the Georgia game I thought was great. Um, and then as the process went on early, I started to see, okay, I get why people like Bryce Young. I see – the moxie that he has, you know, he just is so cool and calm under pressure. I get the Drew Brees comparisons. I get him, you know, under two minutes left in the game. He's the guy you want under center. And he's played at that height his entire life. And eventually you have to let that go. And so eventually I came around to Bryce and by draft night, you know, I was very happy with the selection. Um, I just thought at Alabama, he, you know, he's was at the SEC level. He was, you know, a Heisman champion the year before he came back the second year and had less talent around him to help him. And he still produced at a very high level. So um, yeah. I thought it was the right choice to move, the right choice to make. And I think most teams, even as great of a year as CJ Stroud had, I think most teams would still go back and pick Bryce Young that originally had Bryce Young for the future that he has. Yeah. I mean, all the national media indicates, you know, again, the, you know, the Houston Texans will never say this publicly, but they would have selected Bryce at number one had they had the number one selection, but uh, obviously they did not. Um and, and obviously, we'll see what happens, obviously, for this coming up year, too, for those quarterbacks such as Bryce, CJ, uh, Will Levis in Tennessee. And then Anthony Richardson kind of gets a uh, red shirt year. So, uh, you know, he, he's going to have his really his rookie season. But, um, you know, no matter the quarterback you are, but especially the young guys who were, you know, rookies first and second year, the league has film on them now. So especially as you say, think a guy like CJ Stroud. Defensive coordinators are going to watch the tape. They're going to adjust. They're going to learn. And so, you know, we all can say, great. Yeah, Bryce had good moments. Great. CJ had a really good season for a rookie, maybe the best ever. Great. Well, can you do it again? Because this is how – this is the big boys now. This is in Ohio State or Alabama. This is in college. This is the NFL. And can you do it again year after year after year? Because that is what separates the Patrick Mahomes of the world and everybody else. Well said. Yeah. Who was your, when uh, the draft came around last year, who was your top guy or how would you have ranked the, the big four quarterbacks last year? I, so being, taking my Florida fandom hat off, I would have, <laughs> um, I would have probably ranked it as uh, Bryce one, CJ close second, and Richardson third, and then Levis fourth. Um, Levis surprised me at times last year in Tennessee. He made some big, uh, big throws down the field, uh, put them in position to win some games. His uh, running ability, I've never questioned. His toughness, I've never questioned. Uh, Richardson, he's had some injuries going back to high school, so I was kind of weary on, on that even long term at after Florida. So, um, 
you know, and then Stroud, uh, most accurate passer in the draft last year. Uh, Bryce, like you said, kind of that it clutch gene, um, you know, the hype, you know, he's done it his whole life, as he said. Um, but like you said, just uh, the intangibles, I think, made him the number one overall pick, um, despite the height and pretty much everything else was, a, you know, checked every box. Um, you talked about this earlier. Uh, I want to go back to the goals of year one and two under Canales, uh, just kind of dive deep into that a little bit more. So you said transition year, Panther fans, let, and take our medicine. Um, so expound upon your thoughts on that, and then I'll give you my take, which I think might be a little different, but somewhat similar at the same time um, for first two years under Dave Canales. Sure. I think this year it's getting Bryce's confidence back first and foremost. I think it's building the system around him. Um, they've done that already with the wall of the interior that they built with Hunt and Lewis. And I think they're going to tap into to a center in the draft. So they got that offensive line built back intact. They've got a couple of good running backs. I, I don't believe Miles Sanders forgot how to play football. I mean, he may not be, as great as he was in Philly, but I think Canales can, if anybody can get him back to where he was, I think I'm just I'm looking forward to seeing him in Canales' system. And then just getting the offense to flow better and build that confidence again and take baby steps. We're not going to go 12-5 and five the first year. We're, we need to take a few wins at a time, get Bryce confident, get the running game going, um, figure out what we have. That's the other thing, too. I think we need to figure out what we have and what we don't have. Um, yeah. Is Terrace Marshall Jr. part of our plan? He hasn't come to fruition the last couple of years but has he forgotten how to play football he was a stud at lsu <laughs> i i have a take on him but we're gonna i'll i'll let you finish uh, but i have a take on him sure so yeah i think it's just going through the cupboard seeing what we have what's going to last long term some guys will be here for this year and may not make it through but you know i think this is going to be some guys that people may have already put out the past year i guess you'll say for the team for not being here beyond 2024 Yep. And they might actually be able to shine under Canales on both sides of the ball. Evero's defense, I think, has t is taken, I wouldn't say a step back. I like what they've done as a collective in, I think, being able to, as a rotational team, be able to produce as well as 2023. Um, it's going to look different. It's going to come in different ways. But I think they're going to be more committed to stopping the run, which they were not as good at last year. Okay. I think it's going to be... Um, you know, a collection of people that make us successful on defense versus just relying on Brian Burns or relying on, you know, Xavier Woods or things like that. So, um, and then into the second year, I think it's taking that blueprint and then adding a little bit more. You have another off season of free agency, another draft to go through where you can start to load up more. I think that's when the pitch is really going to start to come in to become a lot clearer. And I know that we want to get our edge rusher this year, replace Brian Burns this year, but there's a lot of guys next year that are coming out that are going to, you know, we could find, our stud guy next year, we're going to probably be in the top six, top seven picks next year. Um, we finally get to put behind us the, you know, the, the trade that made us lose picks this year. So we're finally back to where we're at almost. We're still missing a second round pick next year, but there's a lot of time to make up for that too. So I think it's just, um, I feel like I kind of got off track. Is that kind of where you were going at with the first two years in the Canales? Yeah, no, that, that that's perfect. Okay. Uh, and I actually think they're going to make up that second round pick in the draft. Uh, personally, I, I think we're going to get that back. Um, and we'll get to the draft uh, uh, here in just a second before um, I get to predictions from you and let you go. Um, sure. That'll be the last few things. But I, I, if Terrence Marshall is listening to this podcast, I doubt he is. But if he if stumbles mm -hmm. upon this, Terrence, come on the podcast, my brother. I mean, I want to ask you some questions. I – I'm a big fan of what you did at LSU, as Brian pointed out. You were an absolute stud there with Justin Jefferson and oh, uh, Jamar Chase, which is very hard to do. And he did not forget how to play football. Now, yes, Raheem Blackshear, touchdown, one of the best plays Bryce made last year. And it was called back because Marshall didn't line up on sides <laughs> correctly. That was brutal. I'm not going to lie. but. Marshall has, I mean, it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, Peanut Gallery, it seems like Steve Wilkes was the only co coach that gave him a fair shot. I don't think the Reich uh, coaching staff did. I, I don't, I think he was kind of in their doghouse and we didn't draft you and we're not going to love you, basically. And, and I think Wilkes gave him that shot. I think Canales, as an offensive guy, I think. And, and Isaac, uh, I, I think we're, he's going to be treated a little differently. I'm not saying he's going to be – he might be a post-June 1st cut. He might be a training camp cut. He might be a preseason cut, final cut. 
But I think he's going to get a chance to show what he can do when given a fair shot. That doesn't mean he's going to be on the roster. I realize that, but I feel like they're going to give him a fair shot. Exactly. That's all it is, really. It's just, you know, I don't think he needs to be discounted right away. And to your point, a lot of cuts are going to be made, and he may not be on this roster come September. But um, it'd be interesting to see where the rest of the offseason goes under a new you know, head coach and a new offensive coordinator, both that are heavily involved in taking different pieces and reviving careers and things like that. As we pivot to the draft, I, I will say I agreed with your analysis on year two, having, uh, but year one, I agree for the most part. I just think if we played in any other division besides the NFC South, I would totally agree with the whole top six, seven picks. I think with being in the NFC South, I could see us winning, you know, seven, eight games. And yes, that still might be us in the top 10, sure. But I mean, I think because we play in such a crappy division, I mean, let's 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 spell it out really quickly. You've got a Atlanta's got a new quarterback in Kirk Cousins, who is pretty good, um, but he is coming off an Achilles. We'll see how well he does. Um, New Orleans, Derek Carr has fallen off a cliff since he's been in uh, Las Vegas, and Michael Thomas is gone. Alba Kamara is a year older. Um, their defense is not getting any younger, and in Tampa Bay. I'm not even going to talk about they lost Canales. It's what they lost besides Canales. They lost so many other supporting coaches and staff. You bring back Mike Evans. That's one good player, but he's pushing 31 now, or is 31 now. Um, Their defense also not getting any younger, especially in the linebacking and secondary. Um, And so the Panthers might be last again. I'm not saying we may not be last again, but I think because we play in such a crappy division – I think they're going to have their chance. And they're, as Canales said, you run the ball, you protect the football, you're going to be in every game. I love, can I say as a Panther fan, I love what Tampa did this offseason. Spend, spend, spend the money. They spent the money on Mike Evans, on a guy that is going to be great, but he is on the wrong side of 30. You gave Baker the contract. I mean, go ahead and spend money and think your window is right now because we're starting to ramp up. And when we're going to hit our stride, Tampa will be going the other direction. So I'm quite all right with it. Uh, let's get to the draft now uh, and the last uh, 10 to 12 minutes we've got together. Um, sure. Panther draft needs at 33 and 39, our first two picks in the second round. Um, let's go with uh, – give me your top two needs, uh, would you say, as a whole for the Panthers in this draft. doesn't necessarily mean they have to spend it at these two early picks, but what would be your top two needs going into this draft? So it's interesting you said this, the second part about that they don't need to address it right away. Um, initially, I would say wide receiver and center are probably the two that I really want to focus on. Um, I do think corner is something that is, I wouldn't say it's being overlooked. I think it's something that people think that we can push farther out. I think corner is definitely needs to be in that conversation right behind center. Obviously, receivers, I think, are number one option that we need. And then center, I think we just fortify our line. There's a lot, this is a very center heavy draft, whether, you know, a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson falls, which I find crazy that he's even being mentioned as falling, you know, to the late first, early second. I just, he is a brick wall and I I cannot imagine him falling, but it's just a deep draft at center. So if you didn't get him at 33 or 39, you could get a center later on. Um, But those are probably the three biggest needs I would look at right now. Yeah. I mean, I would say uh, I agree. I think every Panther fan would say receiver uh, center is another one. Um, corner you mentioned is a good one, but I'm going to go tight end. And I, and he, the reason I say that is because um, I love Tommy Tremble. Again, Tommy, if you're listening to this, please come on this podcast. Big fan of you, buddy. Um, but I think he can be a co tight end one with a, with a, with a guy who gets a little bit heavier catch radius, a guy who can come in as a rookie and really dominate, and then Trimble can be that tight end two uh, slash kind of H-back role um, out of the backfield and do some maybe gadget plays with him or uh, maybe kind of uh, do some play face with Olsen like we used to do down the scene. Um, I think Trimble is really good at that. But again, I think having a rookie who can come in and start right away, take the top off the defense – I think can really do wonders for us, but I would agree that it's not something we address in the first round, two rounds that can definitely be third or fourth round. But um, so let's get into some of the players then. Um, Let's give me your top 
choice at receiver, you know, realistically speaking, we're not getting Roman Dunze or Malik Neighbors or <laughs> Marvin Anderson, I know. But um, what are your what's your uh, go to center? Who's your go to uh, receiver? And, and then we'll see if uh, they match up with mine. Sure. I do think I know he's been the choice du jour for the Panthers and Panther fans being nice in South Carolina. I do think Xavier Leggett is a guy that they are looking hard at. Um, I really personally, I'm a Xavier Worthy fan, and this is pre combine where he blew the doors off the 40 yep. yard dash. Um, he's produced all three years at Texas. He did it as a 17 year old his freshman year. He put up great numbers. Um, he just produces, he's fast, he's in and out of cuts. He's not just a John Ross speed guy, and that's it. I think he has a lot. Of, he reminds me a lot of Deshaun Jackson. And I think if we could bring a Deshaun Jackson here for Bryce Young, it would be great. But Xavier Leggett, I think. Um, based on where we're drafting at, I think we're going to move back from 33. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if we're drafting at 33. I have a feeling it always works that way on draft night. The first round wraps up, phone calls get made overnight, and a team that's slated to pick first on day two, quite often you see the logo switch and it's a new team selecting first. So I have a feeling we might move out of 33, but that would allow us to take Leggett probably a little bit later at 39. Um, for center, I, I'm a big Zach Frazier guy. I think Zach Frazier... Is, has Dan Morgan written all over him. Uh, he was the wrestler in uh, high school and college. He just, he's big, he's square. Um, I love everything about him. I really hope if we could go back to back with either Worthy or Leggett and then also get Zach Frazier, I think it'd be a great, you know, second round. I actually think, while I, I do like Leggett and I think if we keep the pick, I think he very well might be the pick. Um, mm -hmm. I think... Uh, I'm a big, uh, and as a Florida fan, I have to uh, kind of put some soap in my mouth as I say this. I'm a big Lad McConkey fan. I I, I enjoy watching McConkey's yeah. tape. Uh, he is a, a stud. He can get open with the best of them, um, and that's partly why I don't know if we will take him if he's there because, um, you know, Deontay Johnson. We kind of addressed that uh, with that trade as you mentioned earlier. So, guy like Xavier Leggett might play a little bit. Uh, different of a role than Alad McConkey would. So that's the only reason I can see maybe not taking him. But I, I agree with um, Leggett, uh, but McConkey, I do, ha I favor him a little bit. Uh, Zach Frazier, agreed, could not have said it better myself. I agreed with him totally 100%. Um, what are David your thoughts Sanders, on, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What are your thoughts on um, Ricky Pearsall being a Florida fan since he's kind of being rumored in that in around that time period? Second, third round uh, pick would be outstanding. Uh, I, I could see 65 overall for Pearsall. That uh, would be outstanding. Uh, he is a high ball catcher guy. He's a Keon Coleman light. Uh, you know, he, he can make a lot of catches over the middle, uh, contested catches. He's very tough. He runs really crisp routes. Um, I mean, he's a white boy that can jump. So, <laughs> you know, he, he, he he's pretty good. Yeah. Um, J Jatavian Sanders from the Texas receivers, who I would like to see us get at tight end in the third round. Uh, if he lasts that far, I don't think he will, but uh, you know, you never know. Um, real quick, what were your thoughts on the report that you saw? I mean, and, I, and I know you saw this because you commented on it. Um, Mikey Samersil from Michigan, you know, people, um, mm. there's a couple of rumors about us. Maybe if he's there at 39, you know, the Panthers might take him, um, you know, in the only reason I could see that selection there, if we did do that, in my opinion, is only because Troy Hill will not probably be back. He's one of those one-year rentals, as you mentioned, uh, going after 2024. And so you could slot him into either the nickel or the corner two um, in 2025, and then kind of off you go with J.C. Horn. Um, but I still think that might be too rich for me at, at, at 39 for him. But the problem is I don't think he's going to be there if you wait much past you know, the 40s. Yeah, that was the whole thing that I was kind of coming with, too. I think we're on the same page. Um, I love the player, the talent. I think he's going to be a great corner in the league. He's going to be a great nickel in the league. Um, is that something that we spend that high of a pick on, on such a rich draft in areas that we need? Um, but I did mention earlier, we do need a cornerback. So it's a matter of figuring out, do you take a guy that's that talented and kind of sit him behind Troy Hill a little bit, rotate him in until he gets comfortable so that when Troy Hill leaves, he's essentially hits the ground running in 2025 and he now secures that slot spot. He can play a little outside too. I think, um, I know people see his height and they see the measurables. They might not think he can play outside. Um, I wouldn't pinhole him as an, a boundary corner, you know, as his permanent home, but he can definitely rotate in when needed. If he needs to travel with, you know, a receiver, he can play outside a little bit too. So 
I wouldn't be sad about the pick as a player. Um, I would just like it to be in one of those trade back scenarios where we go back from 33 or go back in 39, maybe in the late forties around that range. Um, there's some really good corners in that 40 and 50 range too. Yeah. I, I, I'm too, uh, I'm not smart enough to project trade. So I'm not, I'm not going to on this podcast. I, I'll let the experts deal with that one. Um, defensive tackle was the other position I was going to bring up um, as a potential a later on need. Uh, Mason Smith is someone from LSU who I feel like a lot of people have mocked to the Panthers, 6'6", 315 defensive tackle, put him up aside Derek Brown in a few years uh, or maybe next year uh, if Ashawn Robinson kind of rotated with him. Um, you know, so that so defense tackle is something I can see. Uh, linebackers, another one, Peyton Wilson, uh, it, Edron Cooper from Texas A&M, um, Jeremiah Trotter, his dad played in the league, uh, Clemson. So, I mean, linebackers are another one I could see as well. Um, though, what were your thoughts on the Josie Jewell signing? Because I thought – I don't think the other fans are talking that about that signing enough. He's a very instinctive, cerebral football player who is kind of in the right place at the right time and – uh, and I realize he's not Frankie Luvu, but um, you know we're all. I, I think a lot of Panther fans are also acting like Luvu was Luke Keekley, which he he was not Panther fans. But he, um, you know, I'm not saying we replaced him with Josie Jewell, but I, I think Josie Jewell is going to be better than a lot of Panthers realize. Yeah, I agree about that as well. I think he um, he plugs a hole that we had. It's a different style, much the way Clowney is a different type of edge than Brian Burns was, where he stops the run. Um, I think Josie Jewell is a great just physical uh, linebacker that's going to be in on every play. He doesn't necessarily have the lateral quickness. He's not going to be the shifty guy that covers the field the way Keekley does or the way people want a Peyton Wilson to cover. But I do think he's going to be a good compliment to Shaq Thompson. He'll be here as a Band-Aid for a year or two while we find our replacement. And he is one of those unsung heroes that like people look at you know, in November, December when he's producing and like, wow, that was a really big you know, free agent that we brought in, we didn't realize at the time how important that was. So I think, you know, to your point, it was a great under the radar kind of sign that'll definitely solidify our team. Um, like we were talking about earlier, you know, it's just some of the parts that are going to make this defense successful this year. All right, let's get you uh, some predictions from you and I will get you out of here. Um, these first two might not be necessarily a prediction, um, kind of more of an overall general feeling. Um, if I ask you, Brian, what is the current state of the Panthers? If you could just describe the state of the Panthers, what would you say? Um, up and coming. I think they've got a lot of good pieces in place. I think they've got an infrastructure and a blueprint. And I think they're finally going to have an identity, which is something I feel like we've lacked for years. So I think they're on the right path. Um, if you were um, in Bryce Young's ear this offseason, what would you say, uh, what is your to-do list for him? I would take a step back and get out of his ear after the last year. <laughs> um, get touche. Just, <laughs> yeah, no, if, um, I would just tell him to keep doing what he's been doing in the past. It's going to click. It's not so much that he is not capable of doing what he did at Alabama here. He is. It's just going to take time think it just takes a little bit of effort to go from make that jump from being able to you know be the best player on the field now you're surrounded by best players and just take your time listen to the coaching staff and trust in himself because he's been a confident player and I think that swagger that he's had has got him through high school and through college and what made him the number one overall pick is what's going to make him successful in the NFL got it well um Let's give some draft predictions uh, on the way out, and uh, I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you get on with your uh, with your Monday. Um, first position that the Panthers will draft uh, with their first pick, whether that's thirty three or or another pick, is what? I think it's wide receiver. Okay. Will we see a running back or tight end selected by the Panthers in this draft? Ooh, I think they go both. I think that. Running back will come first, and I think the tight end will come after that. I think that very surprised to see how many of the top tier running backs they brought in. You know, usually you'll bring in third day guys, or you know, not the top tier guys. I've been bringing in Benson, um, and also bringing in uh, guy from Texas Brooks. Yeah, bringing both of those guys in were kind of surprises when they first came out. So I think they're definitely looking at a running back more than I think a lot of Panther fans thought. And I think they're also going to add a tight end. Um, Canales has always had a tight end in his system, and I think there's a lot of good talent there, and maybe in the early fourth round that might be able to scoop up a good tight end. 
this might be an unpopular take from some Panther fans. If Canales wanted to completely remake the wide receiver room, is there any feeling that if the Panthers, let's just say they for let's say they keep 33, um, do they double dip at 33 and 39 with two receivers? I think they could double dip. Are you asking if they do it at 33 and 39 or just overall on draft day? Uh yeah, overall on draft day, or let's just say, or what if someone really enticing falls to them at 39 that was a really good receiver that they had highly rated along with the guy that they drafted at 33? Do they pull the trigger there? I think I don't think they would do it at 33 and 39, honestly. I think it would be a great world where, let's say they got a Keon Coleman at 33. You get the big receiver, right? Um, and then you wanted somebody a, a little bit smaller. Let's say then Lad McConkey falls to 39. Yep. Could yep. I see it that way? Maybe, but I think they've got so many holes to fill and there's so much talent of wide receiver in this draft that they could take somebody, you know, even in the fourth round, they could probably get a really good wide receiver there. So I think there's a good chance they double dip at wide receiver by the time the draft is done. I just don't know if they would do it at 33 and 39. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, Javon Baker from uh, UCF Central Florida is another receiver that's been mocked to the Panthers as well. I've seen him mm-hmm. along with uh, uh, Malik Washington is another one that I've seen. So a, a ton of receivers, as you said, um, a very deep draft. Troy Franklin, another one who's been mocked at a few drafts as well. Um, all right, last question. 2024 bold prediction for the Carolina Panthers is what? Bold prediction for the Carolina Panthers. Let's see. I'm going to go with Deontay Johnson puts up 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns next year. I like it. That's, uh, <laughs> if we get that, I, I think a lot of Panther fans are going to be very, very happy. Um, I'm going to go with, um, not to steal um, my former um, – guest uh, from last week, Al Wallace, uh, he said J.C. Horn was going to play a full 17 games and go to the Pro Bowl this year. Um, I-, I won't say exactly like that. I'll just say we're going to see a healthy J.C. Horn throughout the whole year, and uh, whether he goes to the Pro Bowl or has some rewards, that would be great, but I, I think we're just going to see a- another level of J.C. Horn that we are not we haven't seen yet, and that means hopefully staying healthy for all 17 games. So, oh, I-, I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Brian, uh, as I said at the top, uh, my guest today, uh, Brian from um, former Cat Crave and former Panther Wire writer. Brian, before we let you go, is there anything you want to plug on the podcast? Where can people find you and uh, anything you want to uh, promote? No, you just want to uh, at me on Twitter, Brian Palmisi on Twitter. I'd love to interact and just talk Panthers football. It's a 365 business and it's always fun talking whether it's draft season, off season, regular season. Um, it's just great talking with Panther fans. So I really appreciate the time and for you having me on your podcast as well. Absolutely. And we'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And that will wrap up episode number 32 of Inside the Vault, a Carolina Panthers podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Smith. Rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And we will see you next time.